Did we order Chinese, Greek, and Italian food last night? And hot dogs. Ugh, last night's a blur. Hey, what did we end up watching? Uh, was it Baby Monitor Sound of Fear or Coed Call Girl? No, I'd remember if we'd rocked a spelling. Hey, they should make a Lifetime movie out of that poor Tori spelling falling at Benihana. Teppanyaki, Grill of Death. We have limited time. Should we skip the town tour? We can't skip the town tour. Well, we'll keep it short. There's a debate going on whether or not to take the phone booth out. But where would Superman change when he comes to save our town from Ben Affleck? I made the same excellent point. I am not making tater tots. Why not? We need sustenance. You're eating tacos. They're organic. Ah, and I saw you grab those mini donuts, put them down right now. <gasps> Mom? Oh, yes. Isn't it wonderful? <sighs> it's, it's the whole wall. This is my time to be rootless. And you're okay with this vagabond existence she's leading? She's Jack Kerouac. She's on the roading it, past the peyote. But after you pass the peyote, what bathroom will you use to throw up in? Hmm, delicious. Explain to me again who that person is. Oh, that I could. Loving you the I way thought I, I knew exactly what I wanted, where I was going, but lately, I don't know, things seem hazier. We're happy. Luke and I are happy. I don't know how to do this. I was married for 50 years. Half of me is gone. I'm decluttering my life. If it brings you joy, you keep it. And if it doesn't, out it goes. No joy. He's taking the dining room chairs. They don't bring me joy. I'm feeling very lost these days. I have no job. I have no credit. I have no underwear. What? Could have been a contender. You're still a contender. Wow, are we excited about this? Wow, are we excited about this? No, oh, uh, people, the repeating part is over. I live for moments like these. It was pornographic. I will follow. Oh, oh, yeah. I haven't done that for a while. Felt oh, good. <laughs> Where you leave, I will follow. Hey, everybody. Hello. Hello. So, since it's your first time here at AOL Build, I thought we'd make you feel at home with a reciting of the Life and Death Brigades, oft uh, the mantra in Omnius Paratus. Oh, okay. So, can everyone join me in welcoming, welcoming in Omnius Paratus? In Omnius Paratus! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I can now check that off my bucket list. Oh, yeah. Uh, I love the Life and Death Brigade, man, so thank you so much. So first, I want to kind of travel back to when you first got this job on Gilmore Girls. What was it like to come into a series with four seasons under its belt and with such a passionate fan base. Yeah, I came in the, the fifth season of the show. The original series ultimately went seven seasons. And actually, interestingly enough, I auditioned for two characters before then over the course of the series. So didn't get those characters. Um, but I was a fan of the series because of that, because I had researched it. So the process in of itself was a very unique process in that regard of, of having not gotten those two characters. And then um, Logan came around and that first kind of scene that I read was, um, the first episode I did was an episode called Written in the Stars. And they're kind of bantering back and forth about a professor. And I call her, um, you know, I say master and commander. And uh, I want you to call me that from now on. That was my audition scene. And just those words and the pace and Amy and Dan's writing and that character and the way the character uh, pushed Rory to make, make her the best she could possibly be was something instinctually that I just felt that I, I love this guy. I just love this character and I hope it goes my way this time and the third time was a charm on that one, so. Are there any memories from those early days that stick out to you? Well, certainly that, that audition process is one. And then I, I guess I would say in general, Gilmore Girls for me was very much a before and after kind of experience in terms of personally and professionally. So um, in terms, I had never had a job that big before. So in a lot of ways for me as an actor, Gilmore Girls was a training ground in terms of you know, as an actor, you have these marks on the ground that you need to hit to, to find your light. And I didn't know how to hit those marks. And I would always be kind of in Alexis, shadowing Alexis's face. And uh, so all these 
these little things I learned over the course of those three seasons are, are very special to me because as an actor, um, I was very raw and uh, that was a huge training ground for me. So for me, that was very, very special, a piece of it. And then personally, in terms of the amazing fans as we have here and the reason that the, the show is back now is because of this unbelievable fan base. So for me to get recognized on the street or to have passionate fans come up and want to talk about the show, I had never had experiences like that before in my life. So both personally and professionally, that's why I say it was before and after in terms of Gilmore Girls. Yeah, and so the last time we saw Logan before the revival was at Rory's graduation and what is commonly referred to in my household as the worst proposal ever, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. in front of the family, high stress day. Right. Um, did you want a sense of closure for your character after leaving on a bit of a sour note? Well, uh, you know, in one way that, that was closure because, um, you know, it was the worst proposal ever. Um, but I think that what that kind of demonstrated about Logan is, is impulsiveness, which um, that was one of his biggest strengths and one of his biggest weaknesses was that impulsive nature, whether it would be, hey, let's, let's go take a plane here or let me give you this or buy you that. Or I think the fans who love Logan love that aspect of his impulsiveness, his risk taking, and then that's also one of his biggest weaknesses. So I think that that proposal in that way captures that piece of who he was. And in a lot of ways that that proposal at the end when, when Rory says no and Logan basically says it has to be all or nothing and walks away, is certainly there is a measure of closure to that relationship because you know that um, they're not gonna be together. Um, so once I had finished that season, you know, as an actor, you kind of have to put that away so that um, you make peace with that story. And it was three years of my life, but since it's con concluded, um, I have to move forward as an actor to the next job. I have to move forward personally, and there is a um, a challenge in doing that. But in that process you have to make closure with that original series. So I never was expecting any more. Um, I never was thinking, oh, I wish I could have a new storyline for um, Logan because as an actor, like I mentioned, you can't do that because you have to move on to that next project. So for me, I was content. And also with that proposal, I felt like, and I've said this before in interviews, that that also captures Rory's independence, and I feel like that's a major theme of the show is, is Lorelai and Rory. I look at them as like a super team, and um, people talk about Team Jess or Team Logan or Team um, Dean, and for me, it's about Team Rory and Lorelai. So for me, I felt like they were both too young to get married. I felt like Rory needed to go out into the world and do her thing, and that's what she did. So for me, as an outsider, I kind of like that she said no. Yeah, do you think there's too much emphasis placed on Rory's romantic life? You know, that yeah, the Team Jess, Team Dean, Team Logan debate rages on even after the revival has concluded. Do you think there's, yeah, too much focus there? In terms of how do you mean too much focus, as opposed to everything else within the series or? Just, you know, in the fandom, I think everybody in this room probably has a favorite Rory boyfriend, myself included. Um, right. And sometimes <laughs> that can um, dominate the conversation. Uh, right. And I know there's so much more to Rory and Lorelai's life than who they're with at that moment. You know, I think that... <laughs> I think that um, fans are incredibly passionate about that. And on one sense, it's a reason why 16 years have gone by and that show is still relevant and we had a revival is because, you know, love is timeless. 
And hopefully what I was able to show with Logan in this particular four chapters is that Logan loves Rory very, very deeply. And whatever you think about Logan or Jess or Dean and people's opinions on that, for me, I wanted to show that, that Logan loves Rory, Rory very deeply. And so it, it's tough to answer that question because love is a timeless thing. And, and in terms of people gravitating towards certain characters and that love and who's right for Rory and who's right for Lorelai, you know, it's, it's kind of something that's, that's special to all of us, you know, in some ways, whether you're romantic or not, or whether you've been in relationships or not, and um, whether you've been burned before in relationships, whether you've had um, been married for 55 years, whether you've been through a divorce, you know, love is such a central part of our lives. And I think that um, the show is timeless in that way. And that's just one of the ways. So uh, I'm going to kind of give a non-answer on that. Oh, that's good. Um, I, I feel love is timeless. I feel the show is timeless. I feel like there are other amazing points about this show, like the community, um, the mother-daughter relationship. Um, in this four chapters, um, death is a big theme in this with the passing of Richard Gilmore. So there are a lot of amazing themes that are timeless and, and love's a big one. You know, and going off that, I think what I appreciate about each of Rory's boyfriends is that they inform her identity in different ways. She meets him at different times and she grows because, from each relationship. And one of the lines that I liked the most in the revival was during, spoiler alert, um, you and Rory have that goodbye. And she says, it's never not been boring with you. So right. my question is, what do you think Logan has, has taught Rory over these years? Yeah, we went to a uh, reunion in um, 2015 in Austin at the Austin Television Festival. And you can probably hear that siren outside. We're in New York City, so... This is, uh, we're good with that. Um, yeah, so we went, to, uh, we went to a reunion, and Amy said that about the boyfriends. She said that each boyfriend kind of brought out the right thing at the right time for Rory, and that's the way I feel as well. If you're trying to, to pick a team, that's kind of how I've always felt for it. And in terms of the other part of your question, if you could remind me about that, because I got distracted with the siren. Sure, sure, sure. Um, Just what, do you, what kind of wisdom or influence do you think right. Logan has imparted to Rory? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, for me, it's always been about pushing Rory to be the best that she can possibly be and believing in Rory that whatever she wants to be, she can be, and then also giving her every opportunity to become that. So again, in this four chapters, he, he offers a key to um, his house to write this book. He tells her, you need to go write this book and I think their goodbye is mutual in this because um, Rory's kind of literally handing, um, excuse me, Logan's handing Rory the keys to her future. And I kind of have always felt, regardless of what you feel about Logan, he was always trying to make her take risks. He was always trying to have her have adventures and experience life to the fullest so that that can make her a more fuller person, both personally and professionally. So that was what drew me into the character from the very beginning, and that's what I loved most about Logan, and that's what I loved about them together in the sense that I feel like he was really trying to push her, be the best you absolutely can be, chase your dreams, go after your dreams, and whatever you need to get there, I will provide that for you. Yeah, I think that was a really symbolic moment for them. And then when she hands the key back to them and she says, I know where I'm going to write this book, uh, that was really moving. So let's, let's get into that goodbye scene. Um, it was so heartbreaking for so many reasons. What was it like shooting that with Alexis that day? Like we kind of mentioned at the top of this, uh, talking about the Life and Death Brigade, that whole kind of sequence in, in fall, beginning with the Life and Death Brigade, is, is, was my personal favorite for that relationship. I feel like that sequence represents the best of Logan, the best of Rory, and the best of them together, again, with that kind of element of adventure, pushing Rory out into the world. Um, 
Logan comes back knowing that Rory's going through a very, very difficult time and is trying to make her happy and try to make something magical. Um, the goodbye sequence itself, I'm not sure if people picked up on this, but that's uh, actually kind of taken from The Wizard of Oz. If you look at, uh, I don't know, in terms of not having a heart and the Tin Man and the Scarecrow and all that with all the Life and Death Brigade guys lined up, I'm not sure if Amy Pal uh, Sherman Palladino is now going to shoot me because I've said that. Maybe she doesn't want people to know that. But um, So that was a pretty unique thing in terms of saying goodbye. And I always kind of looked at Logan in that period of time as kind of the wizard in terms of creating this magical experience for Rory. And in terms of that last day on set, I think it was my last day that we shot that, what I loved about it is it's a, a mutual goodbye. You know, and if you talk about going back to that question of when um, he proposed to Rory and she, sh she said no, um, obviously Logan wanted something and Rory didn't want that. But what I love about this goodbye is that it's mutual. They both know that, you know, he's handing the keys to her. She's giving it back and say, I need to do this on my own. And Logan is saying, okay, it's, it's time for you. Um, and he says, you know, you, you never needed rescuing Ace. You know that. And she says, I do now. So I feel like that mutual closure and that pushing her out into the world and her embracing her own independence and her going out on her own is a very bittersweet way to say goodbye, but is a perfect way for those two characters to say goodbye. And so for me on set personally, I just, I love that day because it felt very fulfilling to kind of see the character through in such a great way that maybe we didn't have in the original series. And I hope fans, you know, feel the same way as well. Yeah, I think there was some much needed closure to, to their relationship together. Um, you know, we've mentioned Logan's impulsiveness in the past, and something that struck me in the revival was how he's kind of fallen in line with this dynastic Huntsberger plan. And when we saw him in the original run, he was this rebellious college kid who's trying to undermine his father wherever he could. But now we see Logan uh, with a high-powered job, living in London, and engaged to this French heiress. Right. Did you expect Logan to fall in line in that way with his family's expectations? I think specifically with Odette, I think that that represents his, his family. And he's always kind of had his um, feet entrenched in both worlds in terms of Odette is his family life and his family obligations. And Roy represents his true heart and his, his soul and his love. At least that's, that's what... I saw in terms of this piece, and I tried to communicate to the audience, is that um, Logan loves Rory, and he will always love Rory. In terms of um, his place, in terms of his family, um, you know, I think he, he, my backstory that I created for him between um, the end of the original series to the beginning of these four chapters was that... Um, his maturity, that shows maturity to say, hey, these are amazing opportunities. And instead of fighting against the universe, sometimes in life we have to let go. And sometimes we have to embrace the universe. We have to um, accept what's being given to us. And, and I feel like for Logan, that was actually a powerful thing. I think that showed maturity to embrace this amazing opportunity that he had. Um, so that's kind of how I looked at it, and that's the backstory I created. Um, and now his, his personality was right for college, and his personality now shows growth, and embracing that opportunity from his family, I was um, happy to see in terms of these four chapters. Even though, you, and again, you don't really see too much of that in these four chapters, but for me, that was what, I had in my mind when Mitchum sits down at the table where Logan before may have been a little bit like, oh, God, I hate my dad. Um, it's more so of now, okay, he's, he's a little bit of a pest, but um, he's sitting down at our table. But nah, it's no big deal. He just thinks we're friends. And that comes from my backstory of thinking that he's embraced the opportunities that his father's been able to give him. You know who I think would have been very pleased with Logan's direction? 
Shira Huntsberger, my personal favorite Gilmore Girls character. <laughs> I know, controversial, right. but right. I think my favorite Gilmore Girls scene ever is when Emily Gilmore confronts Shira, your mother, at right. that party and verbally decimates her <laughs> and then makes her exit. Emily, Emily Gilmore has a tendency to do that, right? She has a, a tendency to decimate a lot of different characters. But uh, yeah, I guess, uh, I guess uh, my mom would be happy, right? Yeah. So now that the revival is in the hands of the fans after so many years, what is it like to feel that sense of completion or to go out and see Gilmore Girls fans coming up to you, to look at this audience today and see how many people are so in love with this series? Very happy, you know, because as an actor, one of the reasons I became an actor is because I love to try and make an impact on people that I may never have a chance to meet. So through hopefully my work, I can make somebody, um, I know everybody doesn't love the character of Logan, you know, for example, but if they don't love that character, I'm making them feel something or I'm entertaining them or, or in that goodbye sequence, I'm gonna spoil something for, for you. You told me backstage you had tears in your eyes. A lot of tears. A lot of tears. Remember we were doing the Yeah, okay. The frame. In the back, we were we were giving each other the frame in the back, <laughs> right? My friend Leslie, she said she had tears in her eyes, you know. So moving. That that makes me feel great. And in terms of thinking about 16 years with this show and different age groups and different generations and mothers and daughters watching this show, if I could have a little bit of an impact on making somebody think or feel or just simply entertained, then that's very rewarding for me both personally and professionally. And for Gilmore Girls, that's certainly been the case. So anytime I meet any fan, whether they're a, a, a Logan fan or a Jess fan or a Dean fan or whatever the case may be, for me, it's incredibly rewarding because hopefully I've had an impact on a lot of people that normally I wouldn't be able to if, if this wasn't my profession. You know, and speaking of the fans, I think the final four words kind of sent everybody into a tizzy. There was a like, social media freaked out. I'm still emotionally reeling. Um, so if you haven't seen Fall, please close your ears. Um, I have a theory. <laughs> okay. okay. Bear with me. And I ran this by Scott Patterson, who plays Luke yesterday, and he did not say it was not true. Okay. Um, so if the final four words are meant to indicate that Rory's path will mirror Lorelai's in a sense, that they're connected in this way. Right. Then I feel like the series set up Logan almost as a proxy for Rory's father, Christopher, and that Jess, Luke's nephew, becomes a proxy for Luke. Right. Meaning that Logan is most likely the father of Rory's child, but Jess will be the one who becomes her partner in life. Right. Would you like to respond? <laughs> I didn't, I, didn't hear any, I didn't hear a question in there. I think that was more of, of your theory. Um, so yes, you can continue. So, so Scott said that Logan probably wouldn't react too well to the baby news. This is your chance to have a counter argument. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first of all, I think I've, I've seen that Amy and Dan have said that, that Logan, they've viewed him as, as kind of Christopher in that way. So I've seen that Amy and Dan had said that. That's not a conversation that we ever had. Um, and in terms of, for me, again, like you asked that question before about who Logan is, I always saw him as somebody pushing Roy to be the best she can be and have adventures and showing that love 100%. So for me, I've never viewed Logan as Christopher and as an actor. That's not something I can play. You know, that's not actionable to play Christopher. So I've never viewed it in that, that way. Um, in terms of those last four words, I mean, it really is Amy and Dan's last four words. It is their story, and I, I'm very protective over those four words, and they did tell me who is the father of that baby, but... Um, Wait, what? 
Yeah, they, they, they did tell me that. Um, I do know the answer, but that's really for them to say because it's, it's their story. Um, and Amy and Dan are, are incredible at, and they've provided me with such an amazing job. And like I said, uh, personally and professionally before and after is in a large credit to them. So if, if they ever want to reveal that, um, then they can do that. But at this particular point, I think the purpose is to do exactly what you're doing, is to fast forward and say what kind of um, mother would, would Rory be? What kind of grandmother would Lorelai be? What's um, in terms of whoever the father is, you know, would they be in that person's life where it would be different than Christopher or would it mirror that completely? And those stories aren't told yet. I don't know if we're going to come back and do more. I have no idea. But if we don't, then I think part of the fun is for everybody to come up with those theories and to play that out in their minds. And I think that was the intention that Amy and Dan has. So it, I guess I'll make the analogy this way, is that sometimes with, um, with music, for example, I love music because when I hear music, I, I see things and go back to places of whether I've been in college or a kid and it's no longer really becomes the artist it becomes the fans and a song to you may be something completely different than it is to me and I love that about music and I love that about art so those four words can be something completely different where you had your theory and I saw about four people back there saying no 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 so you know I like, I like that. I like that it's just kind of left open in that way. So I'm not going to say who the father is and what it would be like, whoever that may be. If Amy and Dan want to do that, they can do it. But I, I like that it's left open so everybody has their own interpretations. Yeah, no, I think it was a very strong ending for that reason, exactly. Um, and before we go to live audience Q&A, uh, speaking of more Gilmore, I know you just wrapped, and I must feel so great to finally uh, put this out, but would you come back for more? Is that a thing that's in your mind? It's so hypothetical right now to know what that story would be. Um, I think what resonates now and why you have an organic kind of in terms of the fans being so excited is because it was the right time, everybody came back, Amy and Dan wrote and directed the episodes. It was on Netflix, and Warner Brothers and Netflix let them do what they wanted to do. Um, and literally all the characters that were the core of that group came back. So it really was a perfect storm in the case of the timing and the chemistry, and everybody wanted to do it. The camaraderie was amazing. Um, so it would need to be... I don't know if you can replicate that, but it would need to be close to that. And at this particular point, we're so invested in the excitement of what we've just been able to do and fans have been able to have that they never thought they'd be able to have. I can't answer that question. All I can say is that Amy and Dan have created an incredible world. I love this character of Logan. And even back after the season in 2007 when it finished out and people were talking about, oh, we want a Gilmore Girls movie. If you go back and look, every time I said whatever, I would do whatever with, with Amy and Dan because um, their world that they've created is so incredible and I love this character. So um, in theory, it would be an amazing idea. Um, but what we've had is so organic and special and pure that you'd want it to hopefully be a little bit close to that if we were to do it again. I think I can speak for everybody in this room that we definitely want to see more. Oh, thank you. Right? Thank you. Thank now you. some audience questions. Hey, Matt. Um, so I remember seeing you in a movie, uh, I Hope They Serve Beer in Hell. I was wondering how you... Are you scarred for life? No. I remember, uh, you remember seeing me, and I've never been able to get out of my head <laughs> ever uh, since then. Uh, no, I enjoyed it. Uh, <laughs> how, how did you get involved with that, and uh, what was it like playing uh, Tucker? Yeah, Tucker Max. Um, a real person, wrote that book called I Hope They Serve Beer in Hell. Um, incredibly unique person, I think I would say for, for him, something that you might not know based on, because that, 
that humor that's in that, that movie, incredibly intelligent guy. Um, one of the most intelligent people I've ever met in my life. Um, they asked me to audition for that role, and I think that uh, for me with some characters that I can play, hopefully, is these characters that could be seemingly unlikable and that hopefully I can make, if not likable, that the audience can understand why he's doing what he's doing. So that character specifically was very divisive, and I'd like to think of the reason I was cast was because it was a challenge to make the audience understand where he was coming from, and hopefully at some points I was able to do that. And I would say throughout my career, Logan is an example, maybe similar to that way in the beginning, and maybe Carrie from The Good Wife as well started out as an antagonist, and then by the end of season seven was somebody hopefully that, that you were rooting for. So I'd like to think I got cast because he's a difficult character to play to try and make him relatable to the audience because it's so divisive. And that's what excited me, that challenge of hopefully I could do that. I was wondering if you, for with Gilmore Girls, if you could pick one of the cast members that you wish you had more scenes with, and why? I really like the character of Paris Geller because she's so outrageous. <laughs> you know, she's just so outrageous. And in this series, that scene again, if you know, put your earmuff earmuffs on if you haven't seen it yet. But she has that scene in the bathroom um, with Rory. <laughs> Yeah, everybody's laughing, and um, rightfully so, because that scene was amazing. And um, I think that that Paris Geller character is so outrageous. I uh, would love to have had some... What would Logan and, and Paris Geller be like in terms of... Uh, maybe they'll get married if we come back. You know, Doyle's out of the picture, right? I would watch that in a heartbeat. Yeah? Okay. You're welcome. Hi, my question is, when did you first learn what the final four words are? And what was your initial reaction to it? And who told, him, who told them to you? Yeah. They were never written in any of the four scripts. So that was very um, under lock and key, so to speak. And I didn't find out until it was either my last day of filming or the second to last day of filming on set. Amy and Dan pulled me aside, and they told me what those four words were. Um, for me, what I love about the ending, beyond what I was saying in terms of um, you can create your own world in terms of what that could mean, is it also means full circle to me in terms of uh, Lorelai, obviously with Rory, and then Rory now becoming a mother, Lorelai becoming a grandmother. And in a lot of ways, people are calling that a cliffhanger. But for me, it doesn't feel like a cliffhanger because it feels like it completes the circle. So right when they told me about that, um, that's the kind of instinct that I had, that this is really full circle, and I love that. I love stories that mirror the, the beginnings and ends. And then I was also very protective of those four words because they trusted me to not say anything to anybody and to have it get out. And I know how long Amy's been holding on to those words. And so for me, I was kind of a little bit nervous. Oh, man, I don't know, I don't know if I wanted them to tell me that. You know, am I going to rush out and tell somebody? Which I never did because I was just so protective because they trusted me in that way. Any more questions? Uh, yeah, I have one. Uh, with so much time passing between the revival and the end of the original show, was it difficult to get back into character? And was there any type of process you had to go through in order to do that? I was doing The Good Wife at the same time, um, the end of season seven, and then um, was flying actually back and forth doing both of those characters. So it was an interesting experience for me to be finishing one character I played for seven years and going back to a character that um, I played for three seasons on Gilmore Girls. In the beginning, when I was preparing, the hardest thing to get back into was the pace of the dialogue, especially having done 
the good wife where I was trying to create moments without saying anything and trying to create moments with pauses and beats. But with Gilmore Girls, you have to create those moments within the lines and within the beats. So th that was the challenging part was um, that pace. But Amy and Dan's dialogue is so great. The characters are so well written that once I started getting that pace down, then the characters started coming back to me. I rewatched a lot of the other episodes, the original episodes, which helped. So once I was on set, first day was the Life and Death Brigade stuff, and that banter came back right away. Once I was on set, the character was right there. But in terms of the preparation, um, it was a little bit of a challenge, especially in terms of that pace. Okay, we're gonna wrap up, and let's do that by, Matt, would you please remind everyone where they can check out Gilmore Girls, A Year in the Life? It's on Netflix, um, four 90-minute chapters, and uh, if you haven't seen it, check it out, and I hope you guys like it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.